one of the reasons I volunteered to do this is because I like to talk, uh, but more than that, I like to learn. And since I've switched careers and become a photographer and retired from the National Gallery, uh, where I was a museum educator, I like talking to the other artists and finding out why they do the things they do and what led them to their career uh, as artists. So uh, Mike, I, I noticed when he started to participate in our shows, uh, I guess it was about two years ago, Mike, maybe a little more than that. What about do you think? three or four. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and his work really uh, impressed me in a lot of different ways. And that's part of what I want to ask him about and get him to talk about. Um, so we'll jump right in and for maybe 20 or 30 minutes, Mike and I will talk. And uh, hopefully during that time, uh, you'll find things to, uh, that are interesting, that especially that Mike will say. Uh, I don't know that I'll say anything interesting, but uh, I hope he will. I expect he will. And then we'll open it up for questions. So we'll wrap the whole thing up in a maximum of an hour. But, um, you know, if, if Mike is so eloquent and uh, articulate about his work, maybe there won't be any questions because he'll answer all the questions uh, as we go along. Um, what I'd like to start with is that Mike paints wonderful uh, architectural uh, subjects and still lives. And I think it was the still lives, Mike, that caught my attention first. And then when I was looking at your website more carefully, I saw that you're from Western Pennsylvania. Yeah. Since a lot of your still lives have to do with tools and mechanical things, I wondered, is there any connection from your uh, youth, from your uh, experiences growing up in Western Pennsylvania, which is heavily industrialized? Oh, well, yes. And for one thing, it's very blue collar. A lot of people have tools and use them a lot. And uh, um, it's kind of where I went to school was a uh, state school. So everybody was probably from the same background. I used to go down to the basement and paint the foundry and, you know, do interior scenes based on just the old tools laying around. And I always liked tools. I just think they're interesting and rust. A lot of them have rust in them, and rust is a very interesting subject to paint. It has a lot of color in it. What What did your father do? You said you went downstairs and you painted these tools, used these tools, and and do you have some kind of manual skills uh, that you utilize and enjoy? Yes, but when when I went downstairs, that was at the uh, in the basement of the the college art building. Oh, okay, I got you. My dad had a restaurant, but he did have a, he liked woodworking. His dad was a bricklayer and also a res restaurant tour later in his life. Well, that leads me to the uh, thought that do those tools, when you select one as the subject for a painting, are you selecting them because they have any particular emotional or symbolic significance to you? No, I basically pick them on their shape. I mean, I have a lot of tools because I, I do have a background in construction. I built uh, crates for shipping artwork. I, I worked with museums for about 20 some years uh, as a subcontractor. So tools are, I got tons of tools. I had to get rid of so many tools when I moved here. <laughs> uh, basically it's a shape, not really a, an emotional connection to an individual tool. Okay, and is it new tools, old tools, or just any tool when the shape is one that attracts your aesthetic attention? Uh, any tool. Uh, I w had a studio in Pittsburgh that used to be an old sewing factory, and they had hundreds of old sewing machines, which were very interesting. Yeah. Uh, and I had kind of stuff like that. So I would drag stuff into my studio back there and paint them too. <laughs> And uh, just stuff I would get, you know, people would leave stuff around, pick it up. Well, in a minute, I'd like to talk about one of the paintings that uh, you and I mentioned uh, uh, when we had a conversation yesterday. But as I've gotten to know you better, I found a lot of interesting connections between your life and your work and, and my own. And as soon as you said a sewing factory, the artist that was the centerpiece in my dissertation his brother-in-law, I think it was, yes, his brother-in-law owned a sewing factory, a textile factory in Philadelphia. Oh. Uh, and I've always been fascinated with the images that this artist created 
of sewing machinery in his in catalogs that his brother-in-law shared with him. So why don't we pull up the uh, painting you made of uh, screwdrivers? I think Joanne can pull that up for us. And maybe you could tell us what the thinking process and working process was in selecting and then presenting those two uh, screwdrivers. Well, this was different for me. Um, I had been working with tools. Mostly I would lay them flat. And I tried this painting originally with the screwdrivers. It was a polym. And they were actually, I'm <laughs> pointing to them, they were at the top. This painting was flipped upside down and there was a row of them. And I just didn't look how, how it was working. So I got some uh, clay and just kind of stuck the screwdriver standing up and flipped it around and painted it. And I glazed over it and put these bands over the old screwdrivers. It's kind of thin. You can see a little bit of them if you were up, uh, had the real piece in front of you. And I just kind of liked how the texture worked and everything with that. And they, I like the three screwdrivers. It's almost like a family. <laughs> is the uh, is the tool on the far right actually a screwdriver or is it a punch? It's a punch. Yeah. Or a scribe, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, See, that's what so caught my eye when I looked at it, the colors and the shapes, but that not to make a bad pun, but it is a bad pun. It's a, a counterpoint to the screwdrivers because it's it has that sharp uh, tip, that sharp point. Yeah, it's the teenager. <laughs> well, see, right, right there, you've made me think about this image in a whole different way because I wasn't thinking of it as a family. I didn't think of it as a story. I just thought of it as two blunt tips and a sharp one and two, two larger tools and a smaller one. So the other thing that I've noticed in looking at your work is that the surfaces are not um, theatrical, but they're very energetic. What are you thinking about as you build up the surface of a painting like this? Uh, it's, it's not a conscious thing, but I do think maybe it's time to put, maybe get a palette knife and put some thick paint on at some point. But I don't want to do the whole background that way. I also glaze a lot. So like I said, you could see through a lot of these layers. A lot of the whitish blue is a uh, probably the palette knife. Uh -huh. Yellowish colors are probably glazed on. If I remember right, uh, that's how it worked. So what are you, what's happening in your head? that is leading you to make a decision like, okay, I gotta get the palette knife in my hand. What, what is it that you're, what's the process um, in your head? It's a lot mechanical to say I wanna have more opacity. So I need it to be thicker. So I don't want the color to come through, so I'll put it on with the palette knife. And also I have found like light looks more realistic if it's thicker like a, you know, a sky or something. If you put it on with a palette knife, it looks like light where it's too thin, it doesn't work as well. So most of the, the thicker paint is probably the white areas and maybe some color. So when you're, when you're going through this process of creating the surface of a painting, it's not that you're building this with a predetermined structure. It's, it's a very much of a, a flow, uh, an organic process, and it almost sounds like you're thinking of light as a physical thing. Um, I seem like the painting tells me what to do. You know, yeah. I, if I fight it too much, it doesn't work. Um, so I just try something, and if it feels right, I go with it. And if yeah. it doesn't, I take it off and do it again. So it is that, more that way. To me, that means a lot because when I look at your work, uh, I see the there's a strong structural underpinning. And I mean that both about the positioning of the objects, but also the um, position of the brush strokes. And so to hear you say, and 
you're the expert here, I'm the blathering art historian, that no, I'm not reading it right. And that's actually one of the disappointments about being an art historian and talking to artists. You find out how much of what you've read and been taught is sort of the, the, the gospel of the history of art is, is borderline nonsense. <laughs> when you start to talk about why an artist, what an artist's intentions are. So anyway, this is part of what I enjoy. <laughs> no, they're all different. You know, the paintings just, this one just happened. It's the most unusual painting I've done. The only one like this, where they're not, I mean, naturally a screwdriver doesn't stand up like that. Yeah, yeah. So well, that was unusual for me. Is that wonderful coffee pot that I just love the surface of the metallic uh, qualities, would you call this more typical of your body of work? Yes, and uh, except for the background. This is the latest still life I've done. And I just, I think I was getting bored with the background. So I just started playing around with it. Um, I, I like the color. I had the blue in, I had the yellow, but then I, it, it was painted over an old landscape that I flipped upside down. The parts of that are still there. Some of the uh, reflections are actually a road that was in there. And I left the, some of it in there. Um, and the horizon, that green was a patch of green that was, showed through and I'd left that too. And then the texture, I just thought the background needed some texture. It was a little dull. Uh -huh. And I, I do sometimes work a lot where I'll put, uh, say, complementary glazes over my background to build it up and until I get the right shade that I want. And that gives it more depth, especially because my backgrounds are usually right on top of my objects. Uh -huh. Um, I'm fascinated by the reflection in this uh, image. I think it's uh, it's it's beautiful in terms of light and color. So from a purely visual uh, on a purely visual level, to me, but because the image we 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 know there's something reflecting there, but I can't read it. I can't tell what it is, and I find that that draws me in and holds my attention more than if it were a vermeer like surface, you know, with the, um, you know, crystal clear reflection. You could what see were you thinking of? There's a red developed? shirt I had on. Pardon? <laughs> the red is my shirt. I mean, but there's, it's all the back of my studio and the lights and everything. But, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think about it at all. I just paint what I see. And when I step back, is eventually I can, like, oh, that's, my easel there's a piece of uh, my table or yeah. my, my tabaret so and is that almost yeah. always the way that you're working you're working from uh without any intention to communicate a particular image or idea you're working with the object and its surface and your materials as they evolve through the process of painting Yes, the, the I mean the teapot was obviously thought about quite a bit, but the reflection I just kind of forgot what was there and painted the the colors that I saw. And I I, I like to play colors against each other. You know, I've taken a couple color theory classes recently, and um, it's a big part of my work. Color relationships. Well. Both what you, uh, you're saying about the uh, way you develop these particular paintings uh, and what you just said lead me to ask you, when you sit down at the easel with a subject in mind, do you have any specific goal or purpose as you begin to work? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's great. <laughs> but in the very largest sense, do you as an artist, what is it that, what, why are you doing this then? If you don't have a specific uh, goal or purpose for one individual painting, is there one that you have overall for your whole effort as a, as a painter? Well, I see them as, you know, something to work on where I can work out my color and form 
and those things that I like. Uh, form is important to me too. I, to me, light doesn't exist without a form to shine on. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would just go into empty space. So I like to take the other side of it and work with the form. But uh, I figure the painting will work itself out. I mean, I almost probably approach them as abstract. Um, once the object is brushed in, then I just start like a rabbit hole going into seeing. Uh -huh. You just keep seeing more and more stuff. You could paint forever on one piece. Well, I have an ultimate goal of something I want to put on the screen and ask you about, uh, and you're kind of leading me to it, uh, actually. But you just said something that has put me off of that for a moment. You're a realist and a really fine realist painter at a time when young artists, even at MICA, for instance, they're learning to do performance art and digital art and uh, all of these kinds of new media. And realism has been, in the Western tradition, one of the most fundamental uh, aspects of the art of painting. Is that something that you even think about, whether you're being old fashioned and traditional or are you reinventing realism or do you ever think of those kinds of issues that a lot of art historians and art critics uh, and even teachers in the, in the art schools talk about? I do, I, I do think about it, but I, I came you know, to the conclusion quite a while ago that uh, I have to paint, I have to be true to myself and uh, I'm, I'm a math oriented person. I mean, I'm kind of unusual in the art world. So something concrete is important to me. Um, and I just figure there's something for everybody. You know, people, if you don't want the realism, then there's a lot of other stuff that you could go to. So maybe that's why I'm mixing the background in too, like starting to play around with the texture and the color. Well, I have one more of your paintings that I really want to make sure that we have time to talk about. Uh, but before we do it, I'm going to do something that uh, I'm going to use you as a little bit of a guinea pig, and I hope you won't um, object too much. <laughs> uh, no, I haven't done this with the other people that we've interviewed in the series. Uh, I'm going to read you a quote from a very uh, well-known painter who I think is one of the greatest painters of all time, and I'd like your response to it. And it's okay to say, Bang, you know, it doesn't mean much to me. That's okay, too. Uh, and here's the quote, painting is easy when you don't know how, but very difficult when you do. Degas said that. Hmm. And I, you know, I think everybody who's listening knows something about Degas' work. And I mean, that man was a painter. What do you think about that? Uh, it, that seems pretty true to me. Uh if I didn't know as much, I wouldn't be thinking about all this stuff. There's too many thoughts in my head. <laughs> and I feel like I have to really use a lot of what I know. Yeah. yeah. So is an extension of that statement that your training as an artist has been very important to you developing the uh, work that you're doing today? A lot of thought, yeah. a lot of preparation. Yes, I, I mean, I still continue to take classes. Um, wow. I just, there's just so much to learn. Yeah, yeah. So where do you think you, your work might be five years from now? What different subjects or a different approach? Because you're still learning and, uh, and, and trying to learn more about your art? I think they'd get, they're going to get bigger. Like this piece that you're showing on the screen is a 9 by 12, I believe. Might be 11 by 14 at the most. Uh -huh. I'm starting to work bigger. That that'll change everything too. Yeah, uh, I would probably start if I did that. I don't think I would do single objects. I'd start doing things in an environment. But I really don't want to get into a traditional still life on a table. That okay. kind of thing. you know, I don't want to have an organized three three things here, and that's you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then let me get to the question that has uh, I've been dying to ask you, and I did bring it up 
uh, briefly in our conversation the other day, but now I want to really pin you down and, and sort of as much as I can make you <laughs> respond to it because I'm just dying to know. And Joanne, if you could bring up the church with the little graveyard, where you can just see a couple of the monuments over a wall. That's Berlin. There. That's it. Thank you. When I look at this, Mike, I immediately, the first time I saw this on your webpage, uh, was struck by it. I think it's a very beautiful uh, painting that has a structure that is rigorous in the best sense, uh, like it's all there. But it also made me think of what the significance of this church and graveyard and the and the light, the time of day, all of these sort of things working together. And it made me think of a very renowned uh, American realist painter that I admire terrifically. So what made you choose this scene? What made you choose this time of day? How did you put this together? I, I was doing a painting event in Berlin, Maryland. Um, and, you know, it was in the evening. I was looking for a place to paint and just saw this. And it was right there. You know, it, it just everything presented itself. I mean, I had to do the composition. I think I squeezed the little part of the, I don't know if it's a crypt on the left. I think I had to push, pull that in a little bit. But basically, I mean, to me, it was all there. I mean, I might have stretched things a little bit. Um, but the starkness of it, there's definitely something about uh, a hollow, you know, a church and a graveyard that has emotional meaning to people. The one of the things that really riveted my attention, Mike, is that uh, right almost in the dead lower center, where the sunlight is falling so warmly on that corner of the small building, and it yeah. creates a diagonal, and then there's the little. Uh, uh, roof over the door, and then there's the roof of the main uh, part of the church building itself, the, these sort of uh, rippling diagonals, uh, and the warmth of that light there. Is that something that happened purely because of the aesthetics and the, the balance of the composition, or did it mean anything else as you were creating it? It didn't mean anything else. I, I might might have left some things out that weren't important that might have confused the uh, issue, but uh, pretty much it was there. Uh, the way I put it down, I think there was more things in the corner where the church met met the uh, addition. Uh -huh. I don't think I put that in. It wasn't necessary. It would have just cluttered it up. So it's. I'd like to keep my stuff simple. I want it to be. Peaceful, calm. Well, it we can't get much more peaceful than a graveyard. I guess. <laughs> yeah, I guess not. <laughs> um, well, let's wrap up our part of our conversational part of the uh, session tonight by me uh, doing two things. Uh, and one is asking you real quickly. Um, I'm here sort of reading, you know, I'm interpreting. I'm doing what I was trained to do. I'm interpreting your work. Do you find that that is off-putting, offensive, you'd rather I didn't do it, or nobody did it, uh, or what, what's your attitude to the relationship of you and your work to viewers? I, th I like hearing how you view it. I mean, I have no idea how people react to these things. And uh, I, I just assume everybody's going to come to it with their own emotions and everything, and it's going to mean something different to everybody. So it doesn't bother me at all, no matter what it is. Great. Because I always, Any reaction is good. Yeah, that's great. That's sort of the way I feel about it as a photographer. Uh, and I hope that everybody that's listening will be thinking about uh, what they might want to say about Mike's work in a moment. But the last thing I'll say is I didn't look at more than two or three of your works before I thought of Edward Hopper. Yes. What do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, that's quite a compliment. Uh, he was an influence. One of the influences that I looked at when I was in college, wasn't familiar. I, I didn't come from an art background. I had no one in my family that 
did art in any, I didn't know anybody that made art. Um, but uh, when I went to college, then, you know, there was a big, nice group of kids and we learned about Hopper and Ashcan school I was attracted to because of uh, the blue collar coming up in Western Pennsylvania. That just fit right in with everything. So in the Hopper, just, you know, he just stands out. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, I think that not only do you paint similar subjects and you have the same kind of architectonic structure in many of your uh, architectural images uh, and even your still lives, but to me, there's something beneath the surface of every Hopper painting. And that's yeah. part of what it is that has created such a lasting uh, appeal and, and appreciation of his work. And I think that's in your work, too. There's something that at least that I see in the work that I'm familiar uh, with you having made that's beneath the surface. And now I have a little better sense of where that came from and how you how you do that. So. Uh, thanks for sharing your thoughts yeah. and your work with us. And uh, Joanne, let's open it up for questions. Um, I found that uh, looking at those two paintings, Mike, it's there to me. They're very reminiscent of uh, Wayne Tebow. Yeah, he's. I'm a big fan of Wayne Tebow too. Uh, I, I mean, that's another compliment. So to me, yeah, that, I mean, I like his cartoonish aspect to some of his work. Um, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had a question about the church that you had painted. Underneath it, you had three bands of color. If you could talk to that just a little bit about the impact it had on me when I was looking at the uh, at the painting. Um, it added something almost surreal to it. It was a brick wall. But I put it, you know, I left, I know, you know, traditionally you're not supposed to leave a solid line without breaking it or, but it just, I love the orange against that blue shadow. And I thought it's kind of like a, just a, being a little daring maybe, but a little bit of an abstract, just stripe going against the bottom. I think there's a sidewalk and then, you know, there's like three bands. Okay, I have to question uh those are oil painting first they're oil paintings yes are they on board or on cloth uh they're on muslins stretched over a board or glued to a board oh, okay so the surface the surface is cloth and when you paint you actually have the scene or the object in front of you you are not doing it from a photograph on the computer or something like that. Is that correct? Yes, all the objects are. I I am working on some landscapes right now from photographs just because I didn't want to be outside painting because of the conditions. Maybe now I could start going out, but uh, most of the time, if I could set it up in my studio, I'll do it. Um, I thought of it. <laughs> Uh, 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 Jim Dine has a lot of drawings of tools and stuff, and Mirandi, who sets up things the way you set up the screwdrivers. Okay, so I mean, I'm sure that there are lots of influences, and I think what's really interesting is. The way you work the paint, particularly in the background, my only criticism might be to get the background and the object together. You have that more, I think, in the screwdriver, but not as much in the in the uh, uh, coffee pot. Uh, I could show you a tip. I might have one right here is a teapot, but you know, most of the time I put the shadow, it becomes a part of the composition. Uh -huh. okay. And that's why, I, but I like to put the object right against the wall so that the shadow is right there, you know, and it goes up the wall along the side and then back up. And then, you know, play with the colors, you know, compliments and everything. I don't know if you guys can see it in there, but, but I do usually try to 
incorporate it and use fault lost edges and things like that. And I will say, I agree with that quote. The more you know about painting, the more difficult it becomes. <laughs> Even if you're not a painter, I think that's true. The more I learned about that God, the more I thought, how did, how did he do that? I mean, <laughs> anybody else? Go for it, David. Hey, just me, Will. David? Go for it. Uh, when you, uh, I know you're, I know you're planning to work well. Uh, we did out some things together, painting. So I'm, I'm curious because of the, the quote mathematical side of your brain. Do you prefer to walk out the field and try to compose a piece and make things work? Or is that love of organizing that still life the most important part? Uh, I would rather organize it myself. And, it, you know, especially if I can put a light on it and it doesn't move. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's important. <laughs> uh, so you, you do you do pre you do prefer working with in that structure in your studio? Yes. Mm. Yes. I've, I've done you. Uh, the, the one house with the reddish light, we didn't get to that, but that was set up with. Uh, you know, a little model home with a light on it painted in the studio. Mm -hmm. So my son didn't move. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I find we bring that up because very difficult. Mike, if you don't mind, we'll bring Joanne can bring that up because we didn't have a chance to talk about it. Uh, and and I think it's fascinating that you're <laughs> using these uh, models. And when I saw this hanging in the uh, exhibit we have, one. you know, they has over at the Low House Office Building, I thought that it was marvelous and that you were painting a real place. No, no, it's just this little model home, you know. Did you actually have a light inside, or did you just imagine that the lighting effect? I bought a um, a, and, uh, a light that they use for theater, and uh -huh. I can change it to pretty much any color that's out there. And I can, uh, this one was painted with an orangish light. Um, the other, and I did another one with a really dark blue light that looks like nighttime. Um, but are you yeah, going to do more of these? Is this part yeah, of I want to do. My brother just gave me a whole bunch of uh, our old home uh, train set, so I plan on setting them up and going to it pretty soon. Uh, uh, I think that's a great idea. Okay. Any more questions? I have a question. I know you've worked at the Phillips Collection. And speaking of Mirandi and Thibault, I wonder if you have an artist at the Phillips that you consider to be a friend or somebody who work who's influenced you greatly. Well, I think a lot of the works have influenced me. Saw the backgrounds. I think they come from Rothko, sort of. A little. They're starting to get that way. Um, I mean, my own version of it. But uh, oh, there's so many good pieces there. I would say maybe Diebenkorn, the still life. Mm -hmm. I like the still life quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. And that yellow, your yellow is similar to Deben Corn. Okay. I have a question for Will also. You mentioned writing a dissertation and the artist's brother worked in a sewing factory. Just wondered which artist you wrote about. Uh, Morton Schomburg was the artist that I was uh, talking about, and it was his brother-in-law who actually owned the factory. And so, you know, in the um, family setting, I don't know... To this day, nobody knows, did Schomburg ask his brother-in-law to bring these catalogs to him because he was interested in industrial subjects, uh, mechanical subjects, or whether he just saw them lying around. But um, he created a series of works near the end of his life. And by the way, uh, Morton Schomburg died in the 1918 pandemic uh, in Philadelphia. But uh, that was the familial relationship. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Mike, for talking thank to you. us today. Wonderful. Okay, anybody else?
Well, then that seems to be uh, it. Yeah, Mike, this was great. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you uh, responding so directly to my questions because you've really made your work, um, in my estimation, rise even higher because I think you have a really fascinating way of approaching your work and creating these wonderful paintings. So thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you, Joanne, for everything. Sure, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Joanne. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for listening in. Yes, thank See you. See you next week. We'll be back next week with Carol Falk. Ah. So, so see you right. Tuesday. Bye. Hey, good night, all. <laughs> <laughs>